Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. The past week across the national park system certainly generated quite a bit of news. Winter storms the past few months have dumped so much snow on Yosemite National Park that some visitor services and facilities will be slower to open this spring than in past years. Meanwhile, grizzly bears were spotted in Yellowstone National Park. That's a sure sign that winter is just about over in the Rockies. And President Trump both released his budget proposal for fiscal year 2020 and signed a massive public lands bill. Both those documents touched the national park system. For those and other stories, visit nationalparkstraveler.org. Turning to this week's podcast... We'll be discussing politics in the parks with John Freemuth, a professor of environmental policy and the executive director of the Cecil D. Andrus Center for Public Policy at Boise State University. Erica Zambello will talk with an artist inspired by national parks, and we'll point to a few potential summer destinations for your national park vacation. This past week, no, no, actually this year so far, has been a very unusual one for the National Park Service. The year opened with the partial government shutdown that left most parks open, but without adequate workforces. As a result, there was a big problem quickly arising with human waste, both in the restrooms and out across the park landscapes. Then the acting interior secretary, David Bernhardt, told the Park Service to use funds normally dedicated for enhancing the visitor experience and to attack deferred maintenance to pay for maintenance and custodial staff to return to the national parks to clean them up. More recently, Mr. Bernhardt put a hold on the use of those dedicated funds collected under the Federal Lands Recreation Enhancement Act so he personally could review how those dollars are being spent, even though Interior Department staffers worked with National Park Service personnel on those plans. We also saw President Trump propose a fiscal year 2020 budget that would cut the Interior Department by about 14% and which would not provide any funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That fund long has been used to provide recreational improvements and enhancements, not just through the national park system, but across America in state and county parks. Indeed, it has been used to protect water resources, build trails, and even construct ballparks across the United States. The day after the president offered his proposal, he signed a massive public lands bill that, among other things, permanently reauthorized the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which he would not fund. To help us try and make sense out of all this, we invited John Freemuth from Boise State to get his perspective. Welcome, John. Hey, Kurt. Nice to be visiting with you. I appreciate you making the time. Now, certainly, administration to administration has its own philosophies uh, and how it wants to approach managing the country, and, and certainly the National Park Service seems to be far down on the, the list of things. But are we seeing um, more um, unusual behavior with how the Park Service and the Park System are being managed in, under the Trump administration? I, th I think, Kurt, we are to a great extent, and of course, it extends to the other federal land agencies uh, under Interior and, and some of their activities are certainly, with oil and gas seemingly being leased everywhere, gets us right back into the external threats problem I wrote about <laughs> 25 years ago, I think now. But if you think back, there are always swings, uh, or there have been, I would say maybe since, and uh, full disclosure, I'm the Andrus Professor of Environment and Public Land, so I'm speaking now of Cecil Andrus, the Secretary of Interior, and Jimmy Carter. They had a fairly strong environmental stance, more or less. And then things began to swing with the Reagan administration the other way, and we've gone back and forth. And, you know, it's, you, in a simple way, that's understandable because these agencies have multiple things they supposed, they're supposed to do, multiple missions, both to develop resources and protect them. And so sure. depending on who's in charge, we're going to swing back and forth. But it, it, James Watt, for example, who maybe older <laughs> listeners are aware of, 
he had at least had his agency heads in place. Was it William Penn Mott for a while was Ronald Reagan's national park director and Mott was hardly a, a some sort of a right winger when it came to the parks. Dirk Kempthorne, when he was Secretary of Interior, wouldn't allow the management policy revisions that were fairly bad to go forward. He really loved the parks. So it's not a partisan thing per se, but this time, the, and it's just a litany of things that, and again, I used to also work for the Park Service. I was a seasonal at Glen Canyon National Recreation Area back in the day when the lake was still rising. But the transfer of competent superintendents, thinking of Dan Wink at Yellowstone, sort of a, almost a forced retirement in a way, the diminishment of the budget. Now that's happened before, but this is this, and you in your introduction kind of hit it. It's a big reduction. There's no permanent leadership of our federal land agencies yet. The uh, the reduction in, in staff of the Park Service, which leads some of us to always speculate that that an agenda, whether it's obvious or not, or it's hidden, to so render our federal land agencies incapable of doing certain things opens the door for either the transfer of the federal lands crowd or the privatizers. And, you know, there's some evidence that some of that stuff is going on. And you can just kind of go through these kinds of things one after the other. It probably, even though this wasn't Secretary nominee Bernhardt, you knew something was going on when the then Secretary of Interior, Mr. Zinke, put on the ranger hat backwards. Yeah. <laughs> kind yeah. of told us, uh-oh, you know. Well, well, certainly, you know, administration to administration, you know, like, like we mentioned, they're going to come in with a different philosophy. And yet, here we are halfway through um, President Trump's term, his first term. We don't have a National Park Service director confirmed by the Senate. There are vacancies in the Intermountain region, in the Midwest region, and I believe in the National Capital region. Ha- have we ever saw such? No, not vacancy? in my understanding. The, the length of this, there might have been a short period where there were open vacancies for because of retirements or certain needs to delegate something or put somebody on detail, but not this long with no, you know, real attempt to do much about it. And it's, you know, it's not just happened in the Park Service, it's happened in BLM and so forth and so fish and wildlife to some extent. So it's sort of systemic and interior. Other thing I forgot to mention is this review of of Park Service projects uh, that you mentioned too. This stuff is, number one, you got to think, does Secretary Bernhardt actually have the time to review all these proposals to enhance the parks? Zinke had somebody with him that was doing that on any, any grant over $100,000. And we had a uh, multi-year grant from BLM at the Andrus Center to simply help to bring people together to deal with invasives and wildland fire. And yet, because of reviews of all those things, the funding for that dried up. And that was something that was clearly bipartisan. Western governors are worried about that. And so it's sort of a, if you want to freeze up the ability of of getting good science or, or working good projects, yeah, review everything over a certain amount and take your sweet time to do it. Yeah. Any, any gut feeling on the impact this will have on, uh not just the Park Service, but public lands? Or is it going to be a short-term impact or is it a long-term impact? Well, I think it's going to be somewhat of a long-term impact because should a more moderate person at these federal agencies with a new president who may or may not know much about the public lands either, I mean, Barack Obama didn't and Bill Clinton didn't particularly, but they had secretaries of interior who did. That I, I, I was talking to some people who've spent time in other administrations saying it's going to take the first two years of the next presidential administration to unwind and, and you know, try to get some of the damage here fixed before you can go, go ahead just back to sort of what the status quo was before this chaos happened. Yeah, it's really been a, an interesting time. We've been talking with John Freemuth, a professor of environmental policy and executive director of the Cecil D. Andrus Center for Public Policy at Boise State. We're going to take a short break now. We'll be right back.
listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. So, John, it, it's been an interesting turn with uh, the Democrats taking over the House of Representatives, and we've had a, a flip of all the um, committee leaderships, um, especially looking at the House Natural Resources Committee with uh, Raul Grijalva taking over the, the chairmanship. I guess we can see quite a change in, in the approach to um, oversight for the Interior Department. Oh, I would think so. I mean, this should remind all your listeners that of the wisdom of the founders, which is checks and balances matter. And we're seeing it right now. And you're going to see a lot of oversight. Now, let's hope it's not wasted on frivolous posturing, but things we really need to know about. Now, the area I was a ranger, the the Red Rock country of, of, of southern Utah, I know that country pretty well, but not as well as some. And this whole in, uh, review of the two Antiquities Act proclamations, and now coming out in, in I think, your place and others, that the BLM more or less had documents that how important grand staircases archaeology and other cultural resources were and paleontology yeah and 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 uh, and, and same with bears ears and the point would be the agencies themselves were saying what they had there and along comes that antiquities act proclamation that reduces those so quickly you're going to get oversight on that of course we know their lawsuits anyway uh, and it's fun to speculate about what a court might or might not do, but you're beginning to wonder if it's attackable simply because what's ever in the proclamation isn't even backed up by the evidence of the agency professionals who have the very tough task of managing a place like Grand Staircase next to, our, of course, our famous park units and are trying to figure out what to do with bears here. So you'll see oversight on that. I think maybe some of the... Uh, it's probably a little late to talk about Dan Wink, but what's what? What are some of these transfers about? Why isn't there a director? How can you how can you talk rhetorically one hand about improving the park experience and cut four hundred positions out of the agency? You know that's that classic thing that drives us all crazy: do more with less, right? Yeah, well, yeah. These are our national parks that are cherished all around the world, and so are the other uh, lands. The BLM is really. I feel for them now. I've done a lot of work with them. And the fact that they have to, there's part of them that are sort of oil and gas people, but a lot of other people in that agency are not, but they can't do anything about it right now. And it's, you know, it's all of that stuff is probably going to get looked at and it should. Well, I was going to say the the, the big problem with, with Bears Ears and, and Grand Staircase, it would seem, is that after the president issued his executive order, the BLM got its marching orders and we're going to break these places down. I think they took, what, one or two million acres away combined. Yep. And they were told to come up with separate brand new management plans. And all the while, we've got the litigation going on and now we've got the House Natural Resources Committee taking a look at it. I think they had a hearing today and they got the other voices in there, some of the tribal voices and, and whatnot yes. about the value of these places. And so if the clock gets turned back, so to speak, and the breakup of these monuments is reversed, what damage might we see that occurred in between those periods? We're going to see a lot, probably. I mean, we we already know, and it really goes back, I remember this during the time I was a ranger, of the uh, 
cultural and archaeological resources, not to mention paleontological that are in there, and the arrests and the conviction of people who essentially are pot stealers. There's a great irony here, and this is where I am sympathetic to those who say, I understand the protection of these areas, but don't shine too big a light on it because then we're going to have another set of problems of overuse and people doing stuff they shouldn't do sure, and all of that. But I think there will be, you know, there's going to be stuff that's taken or wrecked or goodness, we've already seen the graffiti on certain places. This is likely just going to enhance that. And that's horribly unfortunate. And to me, we can say it's because these are America's public lands, but even as more important to me are these are cultural, cherished sites to multiple Native American tribes. And it's sort of just kind of sticking a finger in their eye again with this whole business. You know, one of the issues, the uh, longstanding issue with uh, the Park Service particular, and no doubt some of the other federal land management agencies, has been getting a, a diverse workforce a cross section of America. And I'm just wondering if if what we're seeing taking place now with, with public lands, with the Interior Department, um, and probably the Agriculture Department as well, do you get a sense from from your position at the university that students aren't so much looking for a career with one of these land management agencies? No, I don't. I We at the Andrews Center have a website up, or part of our website is to help students prepare for environmental careers. We have an environmental studies program, as many universities do, that's got more majors in it than this, those old stovepipe academic majors of the past, which still exist. And so I do see a lot of student interest in that. The, the thing that's, the, what we do do at the Andrews Center, we have a women in leadership conference every year. And the federal land agencies, probably a lot because uh, the fire center's here, um, send a lot of people and hold their own meetings about diversity. And, and, of course, the other issue we want to at least speak of is this harassment mess mm-hmm. does go on in these federal agencies. We know it. I saw it as a ranger myself obliquely. And, uh, but the, the students today, you know, whether it be climate and, you know, we can argue all about climate we want, whatever the reasons, they're still environmentally interested and they want to work. Now, If they see more and more of this horror story, you kind of got to work with them to tell them that, look, we need you guys because you're the future. The rest of us are are not going to be around much longer. And so I'm I'm cautiously still optimistic about about students and their interest in the environment, whether it be a Boise State or anywhere else. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Your location there in Boise, you're, you're close to some national parks. Um, you're, You're well familiar with what's going on across the national park system. Overcrowding. Now, it's certainly not a a widespread issue across the entire national park system, uh, 418 units, but there are select parks. Your Yellowstone, uh, Zion National Park, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Glacier National Park, Arches. The Park Service is taking its time, it seems to me, and, and, and I don't work for the federal government, so I don't know how long these things normally take. But, you know, I know the studies at uh, Arches have been going on for a number of years, the same with Zion National Park. Superintendent um, Sholly is relatively new, coming back to Yellowstone to succeed Dan Wink, and he wants to take a fresh look at uh, the crowding issue and how to solve it. Do you have the solution? Do you have the magic wand to um, direct the parks on how to manage it? No, but, you know, it, it takes uh, park leaders and their friends to intelligently and clearly present this to the American people that looks, folks, we know you love these. We're, we're, our problem is a good problem. It'd be much better than if nobody was coming. But nonetheless, we can't keep doing this because it ruins your experience. I went, I actually took a PhD student after we gave a paper in San Francisco and we went to Yosemite on public lands day where there was no entrance fee and oh my goodness it was crowded now i know how to get away from places in yosemite and all that and on one hand look these people are here and there were a lot of hispanics from the central valley it wasn't just upper middle class white people in their in their subarus and their uh sprinter vans you know it was a much more of a cross-section of america that's a good problem to have sure but at some point, it crosses the line where the experience gets bad. 
and the resources start getting harmed, especially in the front country. And I think the Park Service just has to be frank, but also justify why it has to do, in some cases, at Zion and so forth, for what it's doing. My goodness, I remember going to Arches in the 70s, and I'd drive into the entrance station, and I'd be the only car. That's gone. You know, and not shy away from it, that it's a tough issue, but work with a lot of people on it because local congressmen are going to get involved because it's, you know, it's a, it's a boon to their economy and others. And just, you know, let's have that frank conversation is we've got a good thing that's gotten too good in a way. And I realize you need my experience of crowding because I was a ranger a long time ago and knew a different West. I might have an, uh, oh, there are too many people here and there are five people, right? Yeah. But at some point there are too many people and we need a good methodology to show that. I know that I saw an experimental thing the Park Service did a while ago where they could take a uh, delicate arch and superimpose people. And then they would ask, you know, an average visitor, how many people here is too many? And you start getting at least a number where you can infer that okay, if we've got that many people then there and people don't like it, then there's too many people in here. Now, how do we deal with it? So do you think the Park Service is going to have to implement a reservation system in many of these parks? I think they're going to have to do something like that eventually. Because, again, we know that most of us don't necessarily leave the front country. I mean, a place like Delicate Arch they'll go to, but most stay in Yosemite Valley. Most stay on the rim at Grand Canyon. And that's where the congestion is, though I know some of the backcountry areas are, are crowded and all that. And the only way you're going to have to, you're going to deal with that is by some kind of control. But I think you've got to do a lot of work with the public up front to, to tell people this is coming. All right. And we're, we know everybody wants to be in the parks. We understand that. But if we don't manage it, what you think you're going to see and experience when you come to these places is not what you're going to find because there'll just be too many people there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We've been talking today with John Freemuth, Professor of Environmental Policy and Executive Director of the Cecil D. Andrus Center for Public Policy at Boise State University. John, I certainly appreciate your time and your thoughts today, and we'll have to catch up down the road and, and see if we have a Park Service director and see if uh, <laughs> how, how things are moving. Yeah, let's, play, let's put a bet on that. But anyway, you do such good work with Parks Traveler. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much, John. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnp.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. My name 
name is Erica Zambello, and this week I'm talking to artist Lori Drew in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida at the Walton County Coastal Branch Library. Lori has recently installed a library gallery here inspired by the national parks. Using oil and wax, she paints nature scenes as an impressionistic, stylized memory of places she has actually visited. Her techniques create rich texture and color on the canvas, reflecting the ever-changing vistas of natural landscapes. From small pieces that are less than a foot by a foot to large paintings stretching across the library wall, her work catches the eyes of all ages. To find out more about Lori Drew's work and see her National Park series, check out lauridrew.net. That's L-O-R-I-D-R-E-W dot N-E-T. For being here. Thanks for inviting me, Erica. Ask you, how did you get into painting and this unique sort of oil painting and wax style that you currently have? Well, it was about seven years or so ago. I had a wonderful opportunity to take the summer off and do nothing but art. And so I explored different mediums and started off with acrylics. It was okay. I enjoyed it, but I wanted something more. And so on a quick trip over to Asheville, North Carolina, I discovered an artist who was working in oil and cold wax medium. And I thought, wow, this is cool. I got to try this. So I went home and just started exploring and experimenting with it and found that I was very, very happy with the results and comfortable with the process. And probably it suits me real well because it's very forgiving and you can't really mess things up. So it's just my style. Process like, I've only painted with acrylic and not very well. So do you do both (laughs) of them at the same time, the oil and the cold wax, or is it... The oil it mixes with the cold wax oh, medium. Okay. Awesome. And that you just play with layers, you can scratch into it, different uh, drawing times and colors. I like real muted colors, mm-hmm. peaceful colors. And I think that I, it lended itself real well, not only to the coastal things that we paint, that I paint, but also the uh, national park. You're really well known in this area for painting beach scenes and coastal dune lakes. Were you just immediately drawn to painting natural landscapes? Uh, I think it was the colors of the coast that drew me in the most, and I've always, always loved the beach. So it was kind of just a, a natural progression to paint what I love most about this area. But the problem that I started running into after all these years was I wanted something different. I wanted to explore something different. And because of the national parks that we visited, I thought, I've got all these photographs for inspiration. Why don't I just push myself in a new direction? And so that's how this whole thing came about. So tell me a little bit about how you got into national parks. You said you mostly started visiting them as an adult. Definitely only as an adult. I wish I had started sooner. Um, I always wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, and the funny thing was I had this piggy bank on my dryer at home, and it was my savings account for going to the Grand Canyon Mm -hmm. someday. Well, it didn't really fill up fast enough, but Bill came into my life, and he found a way to uh, get me there, and that started on my 50th birthday, and we've been going every year since to some some place to go hiking and explore the, the parks your husband yes so what of the which of the national parks have you been to on your summer excursions oh there's 20 or so of them uh most recently yellowstone and grand tetons acadia and we hit the white mountains in uh, new hampshire we've been to yosemite and to obviously grand canyon Black Canyon of the gunnison sand dunes everglades biscayne bryce zion Canadian Rockies as oh, well. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a favorite thus far? You know, each one of them is so unique and so special in its own way that I have favorite things about each of them. But overall, I can't really pick one that I like better. Because I don't blame you on the just, exact way. It stands out about each one, yeah. which is why they're national park sites. I guess so. Earlier that your idea to create this National Park Gallery grew out of your pictures that you took at the parks. Yes. So what was your process like? You brought these pictures back 
And then how did you translate them to the canvas? Well, I have a rule that I can't go on the next adventure until I finish the scrapbook for the previous one. Oh, that's one. a good rule. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I can't go. So um, we have these scrapbooks at home. And so the pictures that made it into the scrapbook from my files, from my digital files, are the ones that I like best anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, I just pulled out all the old scrapbooks and picked out the ones I wanted to paint, tried to get something representational out of all of the parks that we've been to. And this is, you know, what I came up with. I have to say, though, that it was a very concentrated effort in like a month and a half to get this done because this idea came late. Mm -hmm. You know, just life gets busy. And so anyway, um, it, 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 I couldn't do as many as I would have liked to have done. But I think it's a very nice collection as it stands right now. Correct me if not trying to create like an exact replica of your photo. You're trying to get the feeling of the place. Is that right? Yes, that's right. That's pretty much just the way that I paint. I figure if I want to hang something on my wall that looks just like the photograph, I'm just going to use the photograph. But I like to paint things that, I don't know, kind of bring out a little bit of heart and soul into the work and... I don't use paintbrushes. I use drywall knives. Oh, interesting. So okay. you can't really get real detailed with mm -hmm. that anyway. So it's more of an overall peaceful feeling that I'm hoping to convey. So we're actually doing this interview right now in the library where your works are, are being hung, which is why there's some movement around us in the library. And what appeals to you about doing a library show? Because you, you display your work every year at a library. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, I think that it has the potential of reaching more people in an environment that is calm and quiet and soothing. And people come here to learn and to express themselves. And I feel like the two things really go hand in hand. And uh, it, it's like a private showing for anybody that comes in. And I love coming over. My office is nearby, and I just come over and look sometimes, you know, because there's no, I don't have to pay a fee, and I can come and look at whatever piece is really striking me that day. And no one bothers you. You, just, you just have the freedom to enjoy. If someone like me or another visitor comes to see your work, what do you want them to, to come away with? Oh, I guess I just want, it. you know, when you're an artist, you want to share. And I just want people to enjoy it the way I have enjoyed um, painting them. And then also to maybe spark a little interest to go somewhere mm -hmm. to one of the parks when they can. When we were hanging the other day, uh, there was a, a daughter and a dad. And he was looking at the works and he said, I remember being there when I was a kid. And so I think it also brings back memories for people as well. And it did for me because I'm originally from Maine. And oh, I wow. Pieces yes, were yes. potentially inspired by Acadia. Uh -huh. And of course, I really appreciated that. So if you don't live in local Northwest Florida like I do, how can people see your work and see some of your National Park inspiration paintings? Well, after we hung it, I thought to the same thing to myself is that there's going to be a lot of people who are not around here. So they are all available on my website. Great. I had a separate collection um, put on there. All of the pieces that are hanging currently can be seen at lauriedrew.net. Well, I just want to thank you so much for doing your library shows that I enjoy so much every year. And thank you so much for sitting down with National Parks Traveler. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles off the Florida Keys, just very well might be the most difficult park to reach in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, scuba diving, fishing, and kayaking. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. The Yosemite Conservancy inspires people to support projects and programs that preserve Yosemite National Park and enrich the visitor experience. The Conservancy funds transformative work throughout the park. The grant's donors support help protect diverse wildlife and plant species and restore the precious habitats they depend on. 
Grants also support improvements to miles of trails to ensure visitors can safely access Yosemite's wonders. Visit yosemiteconservancy.org to find more inspiration. Spring's rains inevitably give way to summer weather. Long, comfortable days in the sun soon will be upon us, travelers. But what are your plans? Where in the national park system will you go? Will you go in search of paleontological relics, or perhaps some of the country's volcanic history? Maybe you want to hike down a long trail, or sit by a quiet lake. Or maybe you just want to head to the beach and go fly a kite. The national park system can handle all of that and more. If you want to learn a bit about the country's volcanic history, Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State is a great choice. Though it doesn't look terribly volcanic, with its snow fields and glaciers dazzling white under the summer sun, the Henry M. Jackson Visitor Center at Paradise offers a solid background on the mountain's more eruptive side. Afterwards, hike a ways up onto the mountain's flanks, or perhaps head down a trail into the park's forests. There's always Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. Lassen has a perfect peak that you can hike to the summit on. There are trails through the devastated area that was heavily impacted by the volcano's eruptions between 1914 and 1917. You'll find thermal pools that look like they were pulled from Yellowstone National Park and gorgeous campgrounds by lakes. Nearby in Oregon, Crater Lake National Park is another sound choice with its volcanic crater within a volcanic crater. There are wonderful hiking options and you'll be mesmerized by that incredibly blue water. You can even follow the Volcanic Legacy Byway that links Crater Lake and Lassen Volcanic National Parks. Sunset Crater Volcanic National Monument in Arizona is another area with the greatest earth on show. Volcanic craters and cones are dotted with ponderosa pines, and there's a lava flow that you can hike out onto into the landscape. If you want some history with your park visit, then head to places such as Gettysburg, Morristown, San Antonio Missions, or Golden Spike National Historic Site, which this summer is celebrating the 150th anniversary of the joining of the rails at Promontory Summit. Gettysburg National Military Park's landscape is walkable. Try to envision the epic battles that took place here back on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1863. You can walk the Cemetery Ridge, Devil's Den, and Pickett's Charge Trails, or visit the Soldiers National Cemetery, where President Lincoln delivered his memorable address. The National Mall and Memorial Parks in Washington, D.C. are full of history, too. There are memorials for Presidents Jefferson, Lincoln, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as well as those honoring Korean, World War II, and Vietnam veterans. You can stand quietly in Ford's Theater and try to imagine the shot that rang out as President Lincoln was assassinated. If you find yourself on the West Coast, stop at the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. There you'll find a nice collection of 19th century sailing ships, both wind and steam powered. And there's even a 1914 tugboat that was powered by a paddle wheel. If you want to go in search of some fossilized bits of the past, you can find those in the national park system too. You never know where fossilized remains of some fish, animal, bird, or flower might rise to the surface of the earth. Back in 2010, seven-year-old Kylie Ferguson spotted a fossilized saber-toothed cat's skull at Badlands National Park in South Dakota while participating in a junior ranger program. Perhaps you'll be that lucky too, but if you don't want to take a chance on not seeing a fossil, here are a couple of great parks to visit. Fossil Butte National Monument in southwestern Wyoming has an amazing display of fossils that date back to when this part of the country was wet and tropical. Gar, herring, and even sunfish, ancient relatives of many of today's freshwater species, swam in three lakes known as Goshute, Uinta, and Fossil that shimmered here 55 million years ago. While the lakes are gone, the sediments they left behind have long since been compressed into stone, locking many of these aquatic species in place. Visit the monument's visitor center, and not only can you tour a room full of incredible specimens, but you can also watch as a preparer cleans away the matrix surrounding a fossil. Dinosaur National Monument, located in northern Utah and Colorado, not terribly far south of Fossil Butte, has arguably the best display and collection of fossilized dinosaur remains in its quarry exhibit hall. Here you can see more than 1,500 fossils embedded in a rock wall, 
which is protected by the surrounding building. Among the remains here are those of Allosaurus, Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, and Stegosaurus. Perhaps you're thinking of visiting a seashore to add to your seashell collection. Visit a national seashore and you'll assuredly encounter seashells. Just be sure to check with this specific seashore for any regulations they have for shell collectors. For instance, at Cape Lookout National Seashore, you may collect up to two gallons of uninhabited shells per person, per day, as long as it's for non-commercial use. Now, if you're a shell collector, here are some great beaches to check out. There's Big Shell Beach at Padre Island National Seashore in Texas. The most likely shells you'll encounter here are common arcs, coquina, cockles, and quahogs. Knobbed whelks, bay scallops, scotch bonnets, and other types of shells can be found along the uninhabited outer barrier beaches at Cape Lookout on North Carolina's Outer Banks. At Cape Hatteras National Seashore, a little bit north on the Outer Banks, they say December is actually the key month to look for shells if you want to add conches to your collection. Search the beaches of Cumberland Island National Seashore off the coast of Georgia for shells, and you just might come home with some fossilized shark's teeth as well. To improve your odds of having a nice selection of shells to choose from, visit any of these beaches after storms. Heavy waves can kick up quite a lot of shells. There you have it, travelers. More than enough options to fill your summer. And that's it for this week's show. Next week, we'll be sitting down to talk with the Dark Ranger about what to look for in the night skies over the National Park System. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.